Heavenly Father, we thank you for the continued blessings of this Sabbath day. We thank you for the privilege uh, of being here, of being able to honour and glorify you through our thoughts, our words, and our meditation of your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to a clear understanding of what's happening at the end of the world, both in our own lives, in our church, and in the world. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Did anybody have any questions? Um, I know it's just an introductory study on the nature of man. That there are more things we could have discussed or maybe gone into a bit more depth, gone a little bit slower. I just wanted us to understand that the nature of man is threefold and it's in two parts, the higher powers and the lower powers. And we could spend a lot of time studying that relationship between the two and the three because it has implications uh, with respect to the gospel. We saw that the threefold nature of man is the will, the mind, and I'll call this the heart. The will, the mind, and the heart. And the will is the governing force in a human being. Steps of Christ 47.1 says many of us don't understand what the purpose of the will is and its strength and its ability and its role. And we're able to manage and control our lives via the will. We all do, even though we may not admit to it. All of us use our will on a daily basis. We either will to serve God or we will not to serve him. But what we're unable to do in our own strength is to change our hearts. We can't change our hearts. And this is where Christ comes in. And if we could express it this way, David says about the law, he says, I, something to do thy to will. Do, yeah. I love to do your will. Yeah? So this loving to do God's will, this desire or this pleasure, we cannot manufacture. Only God can give us that. And he can give us to that when Christ sits on the throne of the heart here. When the lower powers are, are, are moved over and Christ sits here, they're not destroyed. We still have all of these emotions, but now they can be placed in their rightful setting. Another way to describe this whole thing is through a balance scale. So I want to suggest when God created man, he was balanced in his nature. In fact, Ellen White says the same. And the balance would be between the mind and the heart, or the higher powers and the lower powers. Adam was created as a balanced person. What did sin do? Did he grow an extra finger? Did he suddenly have this little cloud of anger come in and enter into him? No, nothing like that. What happened? So it's a really simple thing that happened when Adam fell. Fred? He, he becomes unbalanced. That's all that the change happened. What nature would we call this when Adam was created? What nature was he in? He was created perfect or with Sin. sinless nature. And you know, for decades, there's been all of this discussion upon what the nature of Christ was. Was it pre-Adam or post-Adam? And there's, you've probably heard more arguments than I have over this whole subject. And I'm not here to discuss that particularly. But what I want us to see is that when God created man, he was balanced in his nature. And when he sinned, all that happened was that it... went like this, that the heart 
or the lower powers began to take control of the situation. I know it seems strange, but they become they come into the ascendancy, and this obviously isn't ascendancy; it's lower. But and I'm saying that this is sinful nature, and that's the only difference between the two. It's this imbalance. Remember when we started our discussion and I asked you, is this you? And some of us said yes and some of us said it wasn't. And I suggested it's just the house in which we live. Yeah? And I'm not sure how many of us really totally agree with that. But what I want us to see is if this is sinless nature and this is sinful nature, what does God want us to do or become? He wants us to come become balanced again. Yeah? So if we all became balanced, what kind of nature would we have? We'd have a sinless nature. And this is the argument or the problem that people are confronted with when they speak about Jesus, whether he came with a sinless or a sinful nature. Let me ask you the question. Did Jesus come with a sinful nature or a sinless nature? sinful so most people would say a sinful nature but if we use this kind of modeling are we suggesting that Jesus was unbalanced no so if we use this kind of modeling or this kind of framework we'd have to suggest that Jesus came with a sinful nature oh sorry sin sinless nature but there's another dynamic that we need to factor in and it's this body because when Adam was created here, what kind of a body did he have? Perfect. Yeah? And when Jesus came to earth, how many years after was that? 4,000 years later. After 4,000 years of genetic, of genetic mutation, is his body perfect? No. No. So he's certainly not in the same condition as Adam was. And there's an interaction between the physical and the spiritual, which none of us can deny. And I'm not trying to deny that in all of this discussion. There's an interaction between the two. And we can see that simply because it says the lower passions have their seat in the body. So you can see there's an interaction between the two. So, without spending too much time in, in that concept. When Jesus comes, does his body look like that? No. In fact, when you see Jesus, you couldn't even tell if he was the Messiah or not, could you? You looked at him, there'd be no way of telling really, except when glory will shine out of him under, in, in unique situations. So here's Jesus. So what kind of a body has he got? Weakened, defective. I'm going to call it a sinful body, if I can even express it that way. I'm not sure if that's technically correct to call it a sinful body. Is it one L or two Ls? So Jesus has a sinful body on the outside. Well, is this one of the reasons why it says uh, he would conquer him so easily? Yeah. He could not imagine that after 4,000 years of success and... I don't know how much guiding Satan did in Jesus, his family tree, because he already knows the family tree of Jesus, because it's already predicted in the scriptures. Yeah, we already know that he's going to come from the, he's going to be a son of Jesse, Isaiah 11. We already know, Satan already knows what's going to happen. So it doesn't take much for him in his family line to get a woman over there or a man over there to do some wrong. I'm not saying it literally happened, but to take some drugs perhaps, or to do some foolishness, and it then gets imprinted into your genes. You know, we know enough today about gene imprinting that your environment, in, the, in your own generation, in your own life, changes your genes. They, they can already prove this now. So you, not only does it change, it would, it would not only just get passed on to your children, it actually affects you in, in your own being, your own environment. Uh, modifies and changes your genes and then when you have children that gene imprinting just carries on so Satan knows all of that because he understands about gene imprinting 
And he's going to make sure that in Jesus' bloodline, there's a lot of corruption, stealing, lying, killing, whatever, all of these bad things, it's all in there. So when Jesus is born, <coughs> if we can say it this way, flowing through his veins is all of this bad stuff. Yeah? So he's, 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 he comes with a bad start. I can't say it's the worst, but it's not good. If you look at his bloodline, he's got a lot of corruption in his family. So his body is in a bad situation. So as you say, this is why Satan was certain he could take Jesus down. And he tries and tries and tries over again and he just finds this man unassailable because of his connection with God. But in his inner being, in the inner man, Jesus is balanced. So if I use potent language like this, it, people get their backs up and it can get offensive. So I don't want to use this phraseology of sinless and sinful nature. So I just want to call it balanced. So Jesus, in his outer shell, we couldn't really call it balanced. I mean, in his physical form, he was without blemish. Ellen White tells us that. He's perfect, as perfect as a man can be after, after 4,000 years. And can a man look pretty good after 4,000 years? For sure. I mean, you look after 6,000 years today, and look at some of the specimens of men and women that we have today. They look, they look beautiful. You know, many of us don't, but there are rare examples where they have beautiful facial features. Their bodies are symmetrical, both men and women. So we, we, we know that Jesus looked good in form, even though his body's got all of this genetic damage. But in his inner man, he's balanced. So here we are. And we're even worse than Jesus because it's 2,000 years on. And now we've not only got all of our family genetics to deal with, we've got all the chemical poisoning that destroys our being. Yeah? And in, in, a, in a, you know, GM foods and the, the, the whole thing, we, we don't realise how damaging it is. You know, this is why many Adventists who are strict health reformers can get ill. We, you know, we think, well, what went wrong? He must have done some sin, like they said to Job. And he said, what? I didn't do anything wrong. It's not my fault. Was that true? It was true. Many people get sick today, and it's not of their own devising. Sometimes they become very judgmental. But that's not my point. So here's this man. He's even worse, in a worse situation than Jesus is. And his nature is skewed or unbalanced. And what is the gospel to do? It's to rebalance him. Is that possible? You think it's possible to rebalance a man? Yes. Of course it is. How do you know? How can you be certain that it's possible? Because Jesus is our, our example or our pattern man. So he's the pattern by which we know it's possible. In fact, that's why he came to earth. Because he could have died in heaven, if you think about it. If he had died in heaven and he just sent a letter to us and it floated down from heaven down to us, he said, by the way, Jesus died. We could have believed that. Because do you know that Jesus died here on earth? How? How do you know? Oh, yeah, because anybody could have written the Bible. There's absolutely no hard evidence. You know, there's no Roman documentation, really strong evidence, to show you that Jesus really died. So we just take someone's word for it. You know, first person evidence here. Yeah? The Bible. We take the evidence of the Bible and we say, okay, if it says it, we believe it. Whatever, whatever our motivation for that is, whatever evidence that we need, but we just believe it at face value. But Jesus could have died in heaven, and we could have taken that at face value. Yeah, we could agree with that. So why did he come down to earth? To show us, by example, that it can be done. That's what he came here, that's why he died here on earth, because he could have died anywhere. So he comes here on earth to show us that a sinful man can be a balanced human being. And so this whole argument I'm suggesting about sinless or sinful nature, the nature that Christ had, isn't that straightforward. Sometimes it, it can become confusing when we talk about sinful and sinless. And I think the reason for that is because, and I'm not saying I'm an expert, but most people don't understand what sinless and sinful nature is anyway. They haven't understood the nature of man, that it's threefold, what the problems are, what you can do in human strength and what you can't do in human strength. I guess this was like a crash course in the nature of man. 
and if, the, if this is correct, and I'm thinking that it, that it is, then you can see that it's balance that's required. And Jesus was certainly balanced. He never let, let his emotions take control in a negative way. So in a sinful body, you have balance or perfection. And here you are, 2,000 years on, and that is how you live. And I'm suggesting, I think we all agree with this, the purpose of the gospel is essentially just to rebalance us. So if we took it from this way, all, we, all God wants to do is to bring us like this, back into balance. And that balance is nothing more than perfection, isn't it? Right back to the Adam. When Adam sinned, did something change in his nature? Did he suddenly, and I've discussed this already, did this anger suddenly float and come into him? No. There was no change in his nature. Didn't suddenly grow a finger, didn't suddenly become shorter, or bigger, or fatter, or he suddenly had four parts of his nature. Nothing was added or taken away. It was all the same, pre-sin and post-sin. The only thing that changes is the balance. He becomes unbalanced now. And all that God wants to do is rebalance us. And so if it's that simple, and, and at this level it is, I'm suggesting it is, we know that there's the issue about the Holy Spirit and the interaction that he has with us. But we can live in these sinful human beings a life that is balanced and perfect. If we live like this, would we be glorifying God in our bodies? I mean, aren't we instructed to do that? To glorify, body, uh, to glorify God in our bodies. Yeah? We could go to a Bible verse to show that. Glorify God in your body. What body are we supposed to glorify God in? What kind of body are we supposed to do that in? in this body or another body? This one. And what state is this body in? Yeah, it's a mess. I mean, just look in the, strip down and look in the mirror at yourself and you'll see. Yeah. You only know, need to go halfway into your life and it gets from bad to worse. Yeah? So we don't want to, that's why we don't have many mirrors. So in this body, in this weak and frail, you know, ugly looking body in many ways, God wants us to glorify him. Yeah? And are we able to do that? We can. All we need to do, and, it, and it's not complicated. It's hard to achieve, but it's not, I mean, it's hard to run. If you, it, tra training for a marathon isn't easy, but the rules are simple. You can just buy a little, little book, go online, it gives you all the, tells you how to do it, the rules. Just follow the rules and all of us could run a marathon if we put our will to it. So it's not complicated, it's simple to understand, but it's hard to achieve. It takes a lot of effort. So I'm not trying to pretend it's easy in that sense. But once that's done, we'll be glorifying God in what kind of a body? This body. Is that God's ultimate will for us? No. Because when he comes at the second advent, do you really want to look at yourself like this for eternity? Of course we don't. And you know, most of us in this room are all bodily. We've got all of our normal body parts. yeah. But some people were born uh, maimed or hawked or blind. You know, some of us have got degenerative diseases. Maybe we've had something, we've had an accident, we've lost a finger or something. So we wouldn't want to live in eternity with this damage that we've got, would we? So what's God going to do? He's going to change which bit of us? Every. Our bodies. Just our, just our bodies, just the house in which we live. That's all that's going to get changed in the future. Because what's already been changed? Inside, it's already been changed because we're already glorifying God in this body. But God wants us in eternity to have bodies as they were designed or supposed to be. Yes? So I want us to see that this glorification is in how many steps? First, which part of the man? Inner or outer? The inner man. First, the inner man. Let's get us all balanced up in this body. When's that going to happen? Right now. So this is glorification one. And then what's glorification two? 
What gets changed? Our characters? Are they? When have our hearts changed? Our hearts are changed right now. Yeah? So we could pray right now and we say, Lord, change our heart. And it gets changed right now. How long does that change last for? Not very long. Because he wants us to continue to go back to him like this dependency. That's always going to be there for eternity. So what's the second glorification that's going to happen? In the twinkling of an eye. The body. This outer man. So I want us to keep that in the back of our minds. That the glorification process is first this one and then this one. Yeah? And we all know that, by the way, even though you may not have thought about it. So let me show you that you already know that. And we're going to come back to conscience in a minute. I just want to bring this point up. Let's go to Revelation 14. We're going to start looking a little bit at the Gospel. Revelation 14. And we're going to see there the three angels' messages. Now, the way that we know there's only three messages is because if you go to verse 9, what are the first three words? And the third. So, by the time you get to verse 9, it's the third. And if you drop down one verse back, it says, and there followed another. So, if verse 9 was the third, what is verse 8? The second. And if you drop back down again, you get to verse 6, and it says another. But that, that another one must be the first. So even though it's another angel, because there are other angels being spoken of, we normally think about that as the first, or the first angel's message. So I've got the first, second, and third angel's messages, verses 6 and 7, 8, and verses 9 to 11. So I've just structured it that way. And all I want to look at is that all of this, if I can put it this way, all of this is the everlasting gospel. But if we read uh, the first verses, let's go to verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this first angel, what has he got? Okay, he's got the gospel message, the everlasting gospel. And this is what he's going to say. This is the gospel message that he has. It's three messages, and what are these messages? So I'm going, to put, I'm going to put an arrow here, because this is number one. So he's going to say, fear God, give him, glory. give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. So can we see those three steps? Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. So I've got one, two, three, three steps to the gospel, three angels' messages. But in the first angel, you've also got three steps. So I'm going to call this one two, and three. So where would glory be? Step one, two. Step two here. Oh. So we've got step two, yeah? You can see it's step two. So let's think about the everlasting gospel in another way. So let's think about the sanctuary. There's the courtyard, the holy place, and the most holy place. And as you pass through this sanctuary service, you go through different experiences. Yeah? So we can express this in this way. I think most of us are familiar with it. In the outer court, you would receive pardon or forgiveness or what we could, we could call justification. So here you're justified in the outer court. Then when you get to the holy place, what do you experience? Sanctification. So you receive justification, sanctification in the most holy place. What do you receive? Glorification. I just put glory. So can we see that we've got three steps here? 
So we've got one, two, three. And this recurring pattern of three are all different ways of expressing the gospel message or the everlasting gospel. So in this one here, where's glorification? Second. Second. In this one, where's glorification? Third. Third. So can you see there's a dichotomy or a problem here? Why is there glorification at the second step and also at the third step? What's it teaching us? Because that's saying that there's glorification here, isn't it? Because the second step is sanctification. If I line these up, all of these, I would have fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. I'm expressing the same thing in different ways. Yeah? Does that make sense? Even if you don't understand where it's going. Does that make sense, just the logic of that? We've got the everlasting gospel in three steps. In the first angel's message, you have all components. Fear God, give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come. And in the sanctuary model, you have justification, sanctification, and glorification. It's three steps, and it's these three steps over and over again. I'll give you another one. Let's go to John 16, verse 8. Could you read that for us, please? And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And who is the he that's going to come? Jesus. The Holy Spirit. Well, let's read again then. Who, who do you think it is? Who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus says. Do you agree that it's Jesus? Mm -hmm. Pack it? Yeah? So it's Jesus who's speaking here. So... Um, let me go back to verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient or necessary for you that I, Jesus, go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I, Jesus, go away, I will send him unto you. So the him is the Comforter. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And then we could, well, I'll skip, um, drop down to verse 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, this is the Holy Spirit. So I think this person that's being spoken about is the Holy Spirit. And what's he going to do when he comes? What's the work of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Not in this verse, but just generally. If I say, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? Is it to save us? Yeah, to bring the gospel message, to save the world? I think that's a reasonable way of expressing it, the work of the Holy Spirit. It's to, he's here in place of Jesus, and Jesus was here to give the gospel message or to save his people, and the Holy Spirit has now taken his place. What was the problem when Jesus came here on earth? What did he look like? Looked like one man. And can he be everywhere at once? So you have big problems. He was, he's struggling just in Israel. And now he's got to go around the whole world. It's an impossible task. So what's he going to do? He's going to go back and send the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can do what? That Jesus can never do. Okay. I just thought he'd be, with, be around where everyone... Uh... He can be with everybody at the same time because he's a spirit, he's not a body. So there's many reasons why Jesus is going to go and the Holy Spirit has to come. So when he does come, and now he's going to save the world, which is what Jesus came to do, how's he doing it? It's in three steps. Sin... Righteousness and judgment. So I'm going to put sin, righteousness, and judgment. So if we think about sanctification, glorification, and righteousness, righteousness is a very similar word to being what? If you're righteous, you're right and not wrong. It comes from the word right, yes? And it's similar to justification. Yeah? So what I want us to see here is that we've got two judgments, glorification, then sanctification, glorification, righteousness, uh, justification, fear, and sin. Yeah? So this is the third and last step of the work of the Holy Spirit. So once you've got to this stage, everything's finished. All the work has been done. You agree? There's no fourth step. It's only three steps. 
in this process here, in sanctification, you're going to glorify God, one. And here, this is glorification, two. Here. Can you see that? So, in this life of sanctification, are we going to be glorifying God? Where? In the, in the inner man. Yeah? In this physical body, we're going to be glorifying God. Okay? So, in this mortal body. And if you've glorified God in the mortal body, what will he give you the privilege of doing? Glorifying him in a immortal body. So, the difference between this one and this one is you're going to glorify God in both steps, but this is in a or an immortal body. And when do we get the immortal body? At the very end. So I want us to see that in, at one level, glorification happens at the second step, and at another level, it happens at the third step. But we already saw that before in this model. Jesus comes in a mortal body, and he's going to glorify God. It's going to be balanced. And most Adventists today don't believe that that's possible. They just don't believe it. And we're going to do the same. He's going to give us enough power that in our mortal body, we too can live balanced lives, that we'll be glorifying God here. We might call it sanctified life or being righteous. But then, at the very end, we're going to glorify God in a different way. Because now, he is going to give us glorified bodies. So we're not only glorified internally, we're glorified externally. So that's why we see glory in two different places in the second and the third angel's message. So I hope we can see that connection, and it's important for us to understand. And the reason it's important for us to understand is because most Adventists, they most Christians for sure, don't believe that we can live balanced lives or perfect lives. They just don't believe it's possible, and I'm suggesting it is possible. One more thought. Sinners. Are we all sinners? Yeah? Okay. Let's turn to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the godly. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. No, it says, I, I don't, I, yeah, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Just, just read it straight. You said godly. Oh, sorry, I meant ungodly. It, uh, no, I meant ungodly, sorry. <laughs> blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. How many groups do you have there? Two. two. You've got the blessed man and the ungodly man, two groups. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. So how many groups have you got there? Two. Two. You've got the blessed man and what kind of a man? Sinners. The sinners. Mm -hmm. Nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So what, what, what would we call this verse? It's a... What law? We, it was number two in our thing up, up here. Of these rules. It's rule number two. Or was it rule number one? It must be rule number one. Repeat and, Repeat and enlarge. So what are the repeats that we've got? What's the first one? We've got ungodly. Equals what? Sinner. Equals scornful. Okay, now I'm going to ask the same question. Who in this room is scornful? Because no one's putting their hand up now. Who is ungodly? Okay, so if we're going to say we're ungodly right now in this moment, my question to you is, because you put your hand up, so I'm going to get personal now. My question to you is, how can you sit there openly claiming that you're ungodly? Why would you want to live like that? 
why don't you just stop everything, put your pen down, and go on your knees, and get your life right with God right now. Why would... <laughs> So my question is, why haven't you? Because we prayed a moment ago when we started, and I would have thought one of the things that each of us would have done is to get our lives in order, not just, not just sort of kneel and say, when's he going to finish, um, and actually reconsecrate our lives to God. And if we had done that, if we'd all have reconsecrated our lives to God, could we be ungodly? Because un means, like, not or out. And we all prayed a moment ago that we would all come together and be godly. So how in this present moment, not what you did yesterday or this morning, you think, I was a bad woman yesterday. I mean, right now, right now, are you ungodly? Because what you need to do is just stop for a moment. So we'll all stop for a second and just do a self-check. Do a self-awareness check to ask yourself, where are you? Where are your thoughts now? What are your feelings? What's your relationship with God? And right now, if we're out of Christ, one of us should say, actually, can we just hold on for a minute and can we just pray? Can I just pray? Can you all pray for me? And we should all stop because all of us should have the confidence right now, in the moment, to say that there's nothing between our soul and our saviour. Because if we, if we can't do that right now, there are big problems. So I'm suggesting that even though you said it, it's not really true and that you don't really believe that because if you did you'd be panicking and wouldn't be smiling and we'd be I'd be seriously saying okay let's stop and let's seriously pray because our sister is in need so I don't really believe what you're saying it's because we're so meek and um, humble we don't want to be self-exhorted and it's not an exercise in self-exhortation but it says the scornful the sinner and the ungodly are all the same person there's just different names it's just that when, we, when I say, are you a sinner, we're all going to say yes, because we've been conditioned that way, and it's an erroneous thought. Because if I took the word sin, what kind of a word is sin in grammar? It's a noun, it names something. But if I say a sinner, what does it become? Action verb, yeah? Now, so it's a verb. I'm not going to call it an action verb, it's a verb. Now, verbs come in different forms. You can have what we'll call a doing or an action verb, but there's another type of verb, and it's... Sorry? Okay, there's linking one, but the one I'm thinking of is a being. Yes. So a state of being is a verb itself. So if I said the dog lived... I could put an adverb, the dog lived a happy life, but the fact that the dog lives, it means it's doing something. And if, if I said the dog lived, and I said, what's he doing? He'd say, well, he's doing nothing. He's not running, he's not walking, he's not, you're not telling me what he's doing. I said, yes, I am. He's living, because living is a verb, it's a state of being. And Adventists today, through apostate Protestantism, have imbibed the false doctrine that a sinner is no longer a doing verb, but it's a being verb. So I'll try and explain that a bit if you didn't catch it the first time. So I'm going to ask the question, what is sin? And don't answer yet. Don't say it's the transgression of the law. Okay, it is, and I'm not, done, I'm not denying that. But in this context, in, con in the context of verbs, what is sin? Is it a choice? Or is it your nature? Which one is it? When you do sin. Choice. Anyone else? So we, we've gone through all of this to explain... Because I guess the, at one level this is a punchline, that sin is a choice. It's not part of your nature. And the reason when I asked who's a sinner in here, many of you said yes, is because in the back of your Adventist theology and your training, you've been taught to believe that sin is a part of your nature. Because we talk about sinful nature, sinless 
nature and we talk about Christ's nature and so all of this nature gets back it gets into our psyche gets into our thinking and we are now living at the end of the world thinking that we're all sinners and the Bible Psalm 1 clearly tells us so we just read that bit verse 2 but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law doth he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season his leaf also shall not wither and whithersoever he whatsoever he doeth shall prosper the ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away two groups verse 5 therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment when the judgment happens they won't stand nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous so let me ask you what is this congregation that we're in now is it the congregation of sinners or the congregation of the righteous so if this was the congregation of the righteous because this is a church the sinners shouldn't be in here should they because it says sinners in the congregation of the righteous now I know we could sneak in and pretend and hide and some of us do and this is the ultimate end when it talks about heaven in its complete fulfillment but what I want us to see is that in the other way round, where are the saints or the righteous supposed to be? Are they supposed to go into the congregation of sinners? We're not allowed to, are we? So you can s clearly see that there's two groups. So we can't all be sinners. So as soon as I say we're not all sinners, the people get agitated. They're saying, are you saying that you're perfect? That you don't have any sin? So if I ask you that question, my brother Patrick, are you telling me you're without sin? That you're perfect? When can you be? Now. Right now. And, you know, we've been pressurized and conditioned into like a reflex saying, oh, no, 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 no. We're not, I'm not saying I'm perfect. No, I can be perfect in Christ sometime in the future, perhaps, but not right now. And we push everything off into the future and we're too afraid to say, actually, you know, there's enough strength in the gospel. There's enough power in Christ to keep us from doing sin and people don't want to express that and we've become afr so afraid to express that that we're fulfilling now all of this mess and you know, we were speaking earlier my sister and I about uh, infiltration into the church by enemy forces and, and I'm saying we don't need those enemy forces because everything here to ruin and destroy us as human beings as the sons of God is already flourishing and blooming yeah we don't we don't need external help you know if satan died today would we all be okay now we wouldn't we'd just carry on sinning like normal because we're on autopilot now you know it's, sin has got so bad we don't even need an external source and this is a, this is a thing that people don't realize you know it says sin shall not arise a second time in heaven and the question you have to ask yourself is why What's going to stop it? And many Adventists will tell you, you can't sin in heaven. How could you sin in heaven? And as you just said, it's a matter of, it's a matter of choice. It has to be, because if it's not a matter of choice now, why did Adam sin? Why did Lucifer sin? They all chose to sin, and Lucifer didn't have any tempter in heaven. And it's going to be easier in heaven, but it's certainly not the solution. another passage to just reinforce this point first John where shall we go to chapter 3 So there's many verses we can read in chapter 3. Verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. 
Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. How many groups are there? Two groups. You've got the world and sons of God. So, would that be the world here? The ungodly, the sinners, the scornful? This is the world. And let's get rid of all of that. Here we said, the, was it the righteous in Psalms? And what does it say here? The sons of God. Two groups. Now, let's be careful about this. Which one are the Adventists? Not so simple to answer, is it? Okay, which one is the world? Simple. We know that's the world. Okay? So, the sons of God, we could definitely put Adventists here, but could Adventists be here? For sure. So Adventists can be in both groups, but this is for the world. So we read verse 1. Verse 2, Beloved, now I we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. What does that mean? It does not yet appear what we shall be. What glorification number is that? That's number 2, isn't it? It does not appear what we shall be. We'll read the rest of the verse. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now we can manipulate this verse and say, you know, when Jesus comes, we're going to be like him in which part? The inner or the outer part? The inner part. We're going to say the inner part. That's what Advent is going to teach because we can't overcome sin today. But when Jesus comes, in the twinkling of an eye, with the sprinkling of the dust, he's going to clean all of our insides out and we're going to be perfect in Christ. Yeah? So we want to shift this glorification one and put it into two. And say there's only one glorification at the end of the world because we can't be perfect now. That's how most Adventists would read that verse. But if you begin to see this structure, hopefully we can see that what it's being referred to there is this immortal body. We will be like him externally because we're already like him internally, internally in the inner man already. And every man hath this hope in him. So every man that hath this hope in him, the hope is when? Past, present or future? If you had this hope in you. But what are you hoping for? Something in the future. You have this hope in you. What is the hope that you have in you? That when he, co when he comes, what are you going to be like? You're going to be like him. So you have this hope. When he comes, you're going to get a new body. Isn't that this hope? If you have this hope... What will you do now? You purify yourself now. Purification now is glorification one. You puri purify yourself now, then you can have a hope that when he comes, then you'll be like him. Glorification two, the external body. But you've got to have the internal one first, which is purification of the inner man. Can we see that? Verse 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. That was the definition, sin is transgression of the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Past, present or future? Present. present. If you abide in him, you won't do sin. We could talk a lot about abiding in him. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. So I'm suggesting this. Adventists have been deceived. And they have definitely been deceived by the Protestant churches who were deceived by the Catholic churches. So the Catholics deceived the Protestants. The Protestants deceived Adventists. And this is the deception. It says, let no man deceive you. And this deception has gone so far, we're now running on autopilot. We have our own theologians deceiving us. Who were taught by the Protestant theologians, who were taught by the Catholic theologians. In the Counter-Reformation, just after Martin Luther. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So the man that does righteousness is righteous, even as God is righteous. He that committeth sin 
is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. In what body did he destroy the works of the devil? In which body? Yeah, in the mortal body. He destroyed him in a mortal body, which is what you said. That's what Satan was waiting for. He said, you can't destroy me in a mortal body. When you're in heaven, you destroyed me in an immortal body. When you come here on earth, in my territory, on my ground, on my terms, it cannot be done. And God proved him wrong. Jesus proved him wrong. He that committed sin is of the devil. This is why he's got such strong language here. Because if Jesus came and had a balanced inner man, in a mortal body, and he could do it, if we say that we can't do the same thing that Jesus did, who are we? We're of the, we're of the devil. We're still in slavery to doubt. Ask Adventists, do you really believe this is possible today? And most Adventists would say no. And you know why they'd say no? Because they'd look back to their own past experience. And they look over to their spouse, or their children, or their parents, or the pastor. They look around and they say, no one's doing it. I can't see any perfect people here. My response to that is, if a perfect person met you in the street, would you even know what they look like? Do you actually know what a perfect person even looks like? If Jesus is in the, came to your church, and he started getting aggressive and angry, and throwing the tables over and pushing the pews out of the way, saying, you've desecrated my house, would he look perfect to you? You say, this can't be Jesus. It's not the Jesus we read about in the scriptures, although it is. Because we read about it in John chapter 2. Yeah? Our concept of what perfect is has been warped and distorted by whom? It's Satan. It's definitely been warped so that no one can be perfect. Because perfection is so high up there, who could do it? No one. So what we're waiting for is sometime in the future, which never is going to be there, that God is going to come and just suddenly, in the twinkle of an eye, make us stop doing sin. He's going to chop half of our brain out so we can't do any more sin. He's get rid of all of our lower passions and it'll all be sorted out. It doesn't work like that, does it? We know it doesn't work like that. That's why he uses this strong language. He says, if you don't believe in your mortal body, just like Jesus was, that he overcame the sin problem through the strength that was given to him by his father, if you can't believe that, you're still a son of Satan. You're still under his control. Slavery to doubt, if you don't believe it. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sin is from the beginning. Verse 8. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. That's pretty good, but then he gets stronger. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So this is where we get this concept. Not only do you not sin, verse 9, you cannot sin, because the seed is in you. What did we read about the throne which we've rubbed out? Jesus will not, he will not share the throne. He will not share the throne. What is this seed that's been spoken of? For his seed remaineth in him. Is this the seed? Is the word of God the seed? Yeah, it is. The seed was sown into good ground or bad ground. And that ground is what? It's a symbol of the heart. So here's the Bible gone into your heart. And the Bible is nothing more than Christ. Yeah? But these words, are they alive or dead? Are we sure? Are we sure they're alive? They're not jumping around moving? They're just sitting there. If this sat here on this shelf, it could sit there for 200 years. Would you see any life coming out of that? These words are all dead. They're dead words. How do they become alive? When you eat them, and they enter into your heart, and they are exemplified or put into practice in your life, that's how they become alive. Because printed on a page, it doesn't do anybody any good. There are hundreds of Bibles, millions of Bibles, in shelves, in book houses all around the world. Are they living, doing anything? Nothing. Don't do any good to anybody. The only good that they do is not even when you read them. Even that doesn't do you any good. Because you can listen to audio verse or some kind of audio Bible and it can go in, just like goes through one ear and comes out the other. It doesn't do you any good. 
They've got to be retained in your heart. And then they become a living principle. That's how the Bible becomes a living principle. So it says... Uh, for his seed remaineth in him. What does remain mean? Yeah. Stays. Not in one ear out the other. It re you retain it. And it's got to be retained in the heart. Not in the mind. It's got to be retained in the heart. So once this seed is in you and it's retained in there, what does that mean? Because originally on this throne, who was on there? The lower powers. And now they've been evicted. And who's ruling? Christ is ruling. If Christ is ruling on the throne, is Christ going to let you do any sin? Can you do any sin? You can't. Because all of these emotions are all going to be sorted out. And do you get angry? Yeah. Righteous indignation. Are you going to get jealous? Yeah. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Are you going to have lust? Everybody loves fruit or salads or vegetables. Do we have affections? We're supposed to love each other with brotherly kindness. So all of these things are going to remain intact. They'll all be there, but now they've been all purified. And when Jesus is here, you can't do any sin. You can't sin if the seed remains in the heart. But what did we learn? Once saved, always saved? That won't work that way. You can get rid of Jesus really quickly. Because he won't share the throne. If he would share the throne, he'd, he'd say, I'm not moving from this. I'll budge over a bit, but he won't do that. Because that would be committing adultery. And that's Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is all about adultery. And Christ will not commit adultery. So he says, either me or you. Sorry, not me. Me or the lower passions. You choose which one you want. You choose, Will, which one you want. And if you want lower passions, he's going to leave. He'll come back when you invite him back. He's so good while probation lasts. And that's the problem. Because we don't know if we're going to survive this evening, do we? That's the problem. You know, we don't know when probation is really going to close. So that's why we need to be sure for today. That's why today is a day of salvation. When the Bible speaks about forgiveness of sins, what sins are they that can be forgiven? Can you be forgiven of present sins? Can you? I'm going to say you can't do. Because if you're doing sin in the present, you're not even stopping them. You're not even repenting of them. You're just carrying on doing them. You haven't even turned away from your sins. How can you be forgiven of them if you're presently doing them? Can you get forgiven for future sins? No, because there's no future. Tomorrow doesn't even exist. The only sins you can be forgiven are sins of the past. It's remission of past sins. They're the only sins that can be dealt with. So, here Jesus is sitting on the throne. And if he stays on the throne, you cannot do sin. It really isn't complicated. It's just that we don't believe it. And we don't believe it is because I'm looking at Brother Patrick and he's looking at me. And I'm looking at Sister Wendy. She's looking at someone else. We're all looking at each other. Thinking, no one's doing this. And what we need to stop doing is looking at each other. We need to also stop looking in the mirror and all we need to start doing is looking to Christ and not asking him to take control of our will because he won't do that. It's like a game of chicken. Do you have that game here? Who's going to do the first move? And Jesus is waiting for us to do the first move. We've always got to do the first move. We've got to put our will in the right direction. We've got to make our will the same as his will which is a, we're going to will to do something. And what are we going to will to do? We're going to say, Lord, get this corrupt, stony, fat heart and do something with it because I can't do anything with it. And if we give him permission, he'll come on the throne, get rid of the lower powers, and when he sits there, you can't do sin. But it's all about the choice. So you can choose to do it anytime you want to. Um, so we, we could talk more about this. We go to verse 10. It says the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil are manifest. So my question is, is sin a choice or nature? It's a choice. If it's a choice, when can you stop? Right now. But in our church, we teach it it's nature. 
And that's why we say, sometime in the future, somehow, we're going to climb up this mountain. It's going to take us many years. We do ten sins today and nine tomorrow and eight the next day. Oops, we drop back, back at ten. It's like snakes and ladders. Do you have that game here? You get up the top, you climb the ladder, and you suddenly fall, and you go all the way back to the bottom again. That's how, we, that's how life seems to operate, and it shouldn't be like that, because it's not part of our nature, and that's what we're waiting for. So you ask most Adventists, and if you see their answers, they won't use this kind of framework or this logic, but if you probe into what they're saying, what most Adventists have been taught to believe, that sin is part of our nature. And if it's your nature, if we're going to use a proof text now, can the Ethiopian do what? Change his spots. The Ethiopian change his colour, and the leopard change his spots, yeah? And the answer is? No. no. Neither can ye do what? Do you know what the verse says? So let me not paraphrase on this one, because it's an important one. Jeremiah 13. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spot? And the answer is? It's a rhetorical question. Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Is that possible? Can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil? The answer is? No, you can't. So people use this proof text, uh, or they violate the proof text. And they're going to use it in a way to show that it's your part of your nature. Because is the Ethiopian skin his nature? Sure it is. Is the leopard's spots his nature? Sure it is. And they're going to use this to show that we can't change our nature. We're sinners by nature, which means we have to have some miraculous intervention to sort ourselves out. Because... We're accustomed to doing evil and we can't do good. But what this is really showing us, this verse, is that we can't change the heart. It's not talking about the will. It's not talking about our nature of why we do sin. Because sin is a choice. And all of us can stop eating pork, to stop committing adultery, and we can start keeping Sabbath properly in our own strength, in our own human willpower. But what we can't do is enjoy it. Mm -hmm. We can't live lives of pleasure because we all want to enjoy what we eat and junk food tastes good. Men like looking at women and we want to not guard the edges of the Sabbath because we've got a life to lead and money to make and it cramps our lifestyle. We've got family who want us to do things on the Sabbath that we don't really want to do and we don't want to offend them. We have all these reasons for not doing what's right, but they're all matters of choice. And so when it speaks about Jeremiah 13, 23, it's not speaking about the ability to stop, which is all a choice. It's speaking about this corrupt lower nature, this part of our humanity that we cannot fix, but only God can fix. And that's what this is teaching us. It's not saying that we can't sin because it's our nature. Because if you believe that, we can all talk about we shouldn't be doing sin, but it's just a game. And if it was this, if it was this way, what's God waiting for? Why is he waiting and waiting and not changing us? What kind of a God would that be? We're struggling, living miserable lives, and most of us live miserable lives because we're not happy with ourselves. Because the things we want to do, we don't do. The things we don't want to do, we do. And no one's helping us. And whose fault is it? God's fault, isn't it? His fault, if it was about nature. And he lets us crawl along in his miserable life. He says, sometime in the future, at the close of probation, I'll sort it all out. I'll glorify you. What kind of a God is that? Sounds like a tyrant or a demon, I would suggest. The Millerites had to confront this issue. You know, when they had to deal with the issue of the state of the dead, Yes, you know, Ellen White says about this, about the Catholic doctrine of purgatory and uh, the ever-burning hell has been one of the most effective tools of Satan to put human beings, thinking human beings, off God. So they think, what kind of a God is that? It's going to let this little 
child or this teenager who made some mistake, burning hell for eternity. When they're 16 and they don't even know what they're doing. They make this silly mistake, they died, and God's going to do that to them. It puts people right off. And this is what Satan loves. And, and we're falling into this same trap, but on a lesser scale. But the, the logic is the same. If it's part of our nature, why doesn't God just change us? When we've got baptized, why can't he just stop us doing sin and change our nature so we never want to do sin again? Why do we keep on craving it and going back to it? And we say, God, sometime you've got to sort out this problem. And he's sitting there saying, I'll let you suffer for a bit longer because I enjoy watching you suffer. Maybe we'll wait till the end of the world till it happens. And it's not that evil. It's not that wicked. It really isn't. That's why many of our young people have just put off Christianity. It's because they've been taught so many things that are just not, you can't even be found in the scriptures. You know, we talk about Sola Scriptura and we're Protestants and we're not Catholics. We're just as Catholic as the Catholics are, if not more Catholic. I'm not saying we're Babylon, but I'm saying in our thinking. Because we don't even read the scriptures anymore. We just gloss over the verses. And if I read to you that the sons of God cannot sin, I'd be called a heretic if I preached that in a conference church. Because nobody, nobody would believe that. And I'm saying, I just read it out of the scriptures. Just tell me what that means. I mean, just read it in plain English. Break down the words. Get your concordance out. Get a dictionary out. And put it all together. Go to a, a revised version. Go to the NIV. They'll all say the same thing. There won't be any difference. People refuse to read the scriptures as they're written. And the reason is because we've got these philosophical arguments, this education which is against the scripture. And that's what we've been conditioned to believe and accept and not take the scriptures at face value because we're not Protestants anymore. Adventists are clearly not. Um, I just had to say that I'm glad Ellen White um, confronted and that God gave her wisdom and understanding to deal with that issue um, that you just described because that's something that I dealt with you know the, the problem with God being a tyrant because of uh, the punishment not fitting the crime and so but we but this doctrine is rife in Adventism and we don't even realize it we teach it to our children I didn't even grow up in Adventist and I come to an Adventist church and I talk <laughs> Conscience is the ability to know right and wrong, and it brings us under conviction. So what did we read in John 16, verse 8? The work of the comforter to what? Of convict of sin. So he's going to convict of sin. Who's going to do that? The Holy Spirit. You agree with that? What's the purpose of your conscience? It's to of righteousness. Of right and wrong. Which is what is wrong? Unrighteousness. Sin. Or sin. It's to convict of. So you've already got autopilot, it's built into you to convict you of sin. And now the Holy Spirit's gonna convict you of sin. Why is the Holy Spirit doing the job that you're supposed to be doing? This is the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel says the first step is that the Holy Spirit's going to come down and convict you of sin. And my question is, why? When you've already got it built into you, that you know what sin is. It's already built. Your conscience was pre-engineered into you. It was put into you like a plug. You are, you, if you do wrong, you come under conviction that you've done wrong. You're convicted of sin. So the question is why? There was like a, a Pharisees there when he told them about the parable of Lazarus. He says that they won't believe the prophets and the, the writings of the law, the prophets. They won't, they won't believe it whether one comes back from the dead. And we're, it's looking like we're doing the same thing and we still won't believe the law and the prophets. Amen. Let's go to, let's 
stop for this. I'll give you the Bible verse. First Timothy <coughs> chapter four, verse two. I'll read from verse one, give you time to find verse two. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, are we living in the latter times? We are. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I'm saying one of the doctrines of devil is this whole issue of putting away of sin. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What's happened to their consciences? They've been burnt. And if you get a piece of meat and you burn it and you shrivel it, is it fit for anything? Is it alive? It's dead. So our consciences have been seared. Burnt, killed. So if your consciences don't work, what do you need? You need the Holy Spirit, because your consciences don't work. So I want us to think about that. Um, are we going to sing a couple of hymns? or Yeah? So... Uh, so, so we won't close with prayer because we'll close, we'll, we'll close Sabbath with a prayer, and we'll just go into uh, a song.